He is one of the founders and current board members of the Kansas Land Trust and is involved in other nonprofit environmental and community groups. Kelly is an active gardener and enjoys growing vegetables, fruits, and native plants. He is also frequently voted as guy with the best beard at conservation conferences. Thank you. It's great to be here and it's great to come to prairie conferences. And I was looking recently, but the, I think the first paper I ever wrote on ethnobotany was presented at this conference in 1986, or at least in the proceedings in 1986. Uh, I'm from the University of Kansas, and we all have images about Kansas. A lot of the plants I'll talk about about Kansas. Um, but I find a lot of similarity down here. Plant, plant species are related and similar. Um, you know, this is a place where the humidity and the temperature try to compete with each other in terms of who's the highest. And one thing, though, that this place really has impressed me is even more impressive than Kansas. It is flat. This is really flat. <laughs> My God. Where I live, we have hills. It's really flat. I want to push your boundaries just a little bit today. Um, I want to talk about us engaging in our prairies, and I'm going to follow this theme of Christmas and others, that we need to get people more involved. And the push I'm going to make is I really want to see us eat and self-medicate from our prairies. I really think that if we can use our prairies, get people to use them, if we can tell stories about plants that are edible and medicinal, if we can talk about these Native American uses to people and engage people in that cultural history, which is part of all of our history, I think we'll have people work with them more, engage in them more, want to take care of them, want to grow them. So that's a little path journey that uh, we're on here. Start out here with plums. Um, say something more about them in a minute. So many of our restorations, of course, are something like this. We have a crop field. We have a bunch of people collect seed. We get a no-till drill. We convert this cornfield into something that's much nicer. Um, but we kind of do that, and I won't say we abandon them, but you know, we leave them that way and wish we could get more species, and that's difficult. But we have kind of a, a general pattern that many of us follow. And that process does involve lots of people. Here's a, a piece of land in Lawrence, Kansas, City Park area that um, we're planting to lots of species of native grass, purple's hen bit but we're replacing that with a, a diverse array of plants. But we don't give a lot of thought about when we do restorations to edible and medicinal plants. And that's gonna be part of my point to you is that we need to think about including those plants. So uh, I had a grad student who uh, some of you may know, Quinn Long, who now works and directs the Shaw Arboretum at, at the Missouri Botanic Garden. As part of Quinn's dissertation work, a side project, we started looking at lists of species used in prairie restorations. This became very difficult because many of us don't keep good lists. And then you have people do variations of themes. Uh, we stayed away from Bill Whitney's lists, or Bill didn't have many lists to share with us that weren't published, so we used published lists. So most of these are kind of wimpy lists, but things that people have published. Only in seven of those restoration projects we see edible or medicinal plants used to any, any extent. I'm going to talk a lot about some of those species and uh, also provide some insights and in why we don't do that. This picture, of course, shows milkweed and a wonderful pollinator, and we're now incorporating milkweeds into prairies because they're pollination activity. How many of you eat milkweed? Any hands out there? A few of you. How many of you think milkweed is poisonous? You're both right. Yeah, <laughs> right? But you know, tomatoes and potatoes and peppers, they're all poisonous, right? And if I brought, invited you over for dinner tonight and said, hey, I'm gonna cook up a mess of tomato greens, you know, some salt and butter on them, well, you know, you'd get sick, they're poisonous. <laughs> so we, we have to learn about plants. We have to learn what parts to eat and what parts are poisonous. And the young tender shoots of milkweeds are wonderful. The flower buds are wonderful. I do a lot of work with tribes, a lot of the tribes in the Great Plains, the Omaha, Winnebago, Potawatomi, all still love milkweed in their soup. Um, New Jersey tea, it's a really wonderful plant, Great Plains. Uh, hard labor used in restorations primarily because a lot of these things are hard to collect seeds. So that's where a lot of this comes from. Seeds are expensive, seeds are hard to collect, Season, seeds that are in things that are short or small or early or late, um, we don't seem to get. So New Jersey tea kind of suffers that. It makes great tea. 
It's got a bad name. I'm all about changing names. It should be, you know, we should come up with this different name for it. It's only called New Jersey tea because it's also in New Jersey. It was the tea that first replaced the black tea in, in, after the Boston Tea Party. But about that time, coffee was introduced to the U.S. It's like people went, wow, that's, that's good stuff. Whereas New Jersey tea has no caffeine. Very tasty, but just doesn't have that caffeine thing going for it. Mountain mints, another horrible name. These prairie mints are wonderful. We saw some yesterday at, out at the prairie walks that we were on. Um, they vary in smell and taste. Um, they're really wonderful. Um, if you like teas, and teas are very good for us. Mint teas are aromatic. They help us with any type of congestion, help us breathe better. They're delightful. They, they awaken our senses. It's something to share with kids, with other people. If you have mints on the prairie, you should be taking people to them. And of course, another mint, bee balm. Bee balm is, is fascinating to me. Uh, I do a lot of work with uh, languages too, because language and words, Native American words, tell you a lot about the plant. Um, the Pawnee loved bee balm. And the Pawnee's taxonomy, and most Native Americans' taxonomy, was almost as detailed as ours. They may not have kept track of all the sedges, you know, they weren't quite that nerdy. Um, <laughs> But for most all useful species, they, they knew them. There's translations and names. And in some cases, and bee balm's a good example of that, they went much deeper. The Pawnee had four species for our one species of Monarda. Again, think about these mints. It was based on sm smell and taste. Um, so they had a much fine-tuned fine appreciation. And bee balm's another one. Sample it seasonally. Sample different plants. They're different. There's different aromatic compounds in them. They're rather different, much like, think about field mints, you know, there's chocolate mint and lemon mint, all these things are the same species. We have that sort of variation in our mints in the field. Getting back to my theme of restorations, bee balm seeds, easy to collect. We use it a lot. It's not very expensive if you buy it, relatively, although all Forbes seeds are expensive, right? Um, so that's always the dynamic. So it gets used a lot in restorations. It's a great pollinator plant but it's a great plant for tea, and it's a great plant if you have that really thick phlegm after you've been sick. It's really, really good for that. You should try it. You know, we all should be using the prairie for our medicine. We don't talk about this enough, but herbal products can help get us through some of the expense of medicine. Did you know in Germany there's a study done that over 50% of women use herbal products before they go to the doctor? Think about it, if herbal products work, you don't have to go to the doctor. If they don't work, you go to the doctor and have them help you. Most herbal products are pretty safe, especially if you had just a little bit of knowledge. In fact, most herbal products are much safer than our pharmaceutical products. Look at our opioid crisis. That's about pharmaceuticals. So here's a little bit of a list, and you can see that we just don't use edible medicinal plants in our prairie restorations. Again, these are those lists again, you look at these, at these plants. So I'm encouraging us to think this way. We need to think about broadening our palate in what we plant in restorations. Camassia scoloides, it's our wild camas uh, throughout the southern plains. Of course, it's related to the camas out west. This is a major food source. We don't talk about this plant enough. Did you know that there's uh, pit baking that was done in the southern plains? We found cracked rock and pits from uh, Texas up into Kansas. Kind of before agriculture, camas was harvested in patches. People pit baked them to take the wonderful carbohydrate and sweeten it. We don't even know about this. It's a great story. We should be doing it. And people had great ways of conserving biodiversity while using it. Kat Anderson's friend of mine, ethnobotanist in California, written a lot about this with plants out there. We're finding evidence here in the Great Plains. People harvest plants and replant them. That's what we should be doing on our restorations. Our restorations should not be passive. We should be eating our prairies and replanting them. You go out with a digging stick and you dig up the camas at the time the seeds are ripe and you put the top back in the ground. That is a traditional practice. Some people would call that scattering seeds. And if you disturb the soil and scatter seeds, you may get more plants than you had originally. So we need to eat our prairie restorations. Prairie turnip. How many of you have eaten prairie turnip? Hardly anyone. This was the most widely used wild food plant by Native Americans across the Great Plains. 
Almost everybody dug it and ate it. Really common use of food, great in stew, it was used in bison stew. It's a bean family plant full of carbohydrates. Tastes a little bit like uh, peanuts, raw peanuts. Um, really flavorful um, for a carbohydrate, more flavor than potatoes, which we'd use in stew. And we have this prairie turnip paradox. Prairie turnips are not common today. And we protect prairies, even unprotected prairies are not common today. The paradox is that these plants would be much more common today if we ate them. Yes, you eat the root, you kill the plant when you eat the root. They'd be much more common if we ate them and scattered seeds. In reading about historical uses of plants, uh, you read some really interesting things. The Omaha determined the route of their summer buffalo hunts out on the high plains by where they could dig prairie turnips and where they could collect chug cherries. And they would return their prairie turnip patches. Not every year. They rotated to different campsites for that. But maybe once every five years, once every 10 years, they would go there and dig those roots and put the tops back ground in the ground and plant those seeds. They were creating disturbance. Disturbance is an important element. Disturbance is often very lacking in our prairie restorations. How many of you know of really thatchy, grassy prairie restorations? Like, aren't most of them? Right, it's a problem. We need people out there digging in them. We need people eating from them, self-medicating from them. And traditional people still harvest prairie turnips. Uh, we've done work, uh, Lisa Castle, who's at Southwest Oklahoma State, worked with me, studied prairie turnips, figured out this paradox, worked with uh, folks both on the Rosebud and Pine Ridge Reservation, on the Crow Reservation, worked with Alma Snell, who has a really wonderful book called A Taste of Heritage. It's her cookbook. It's her book about the use, traditional uses of uh, crow plants in Montana for food and medicine. Her family still digs prairie turnips. Boy, that just doesn't seem possible if you know prairie turnips like most of us do. You just don't see very many of them. We need to be creating prairie turnip patches in our prairie restorations. And although I'm talking about plants that may not be right here or might not be where you live, you have other starchy root crops where you live that should be in your restoration sites, and you should eat them. <laughs> eat them with kids, have a pit bake, have a big campfire, share that food. It's tasty, it's wonderful. You, you know, it'd be on gourmet chef's uh, menus, it should be, we should put it there. Plums, plums are one of my favorite things. These are sandhill plums, Prunus angustifolia out in central Kansas. How many of you have had wild plum jelly? Isn't that fabulous? Isn't the taste of that wonderful? How can you describe that fully? It's an aromatic wonder of taste. One of my favorite things, makes great sauce. I, I love plums so much. And you learn how to work with them. You know, I just pick them whole and freeze them and work them up in the wintertime. I have a nice colander, you know, just boil them, run them through the colander, and you get wonderful plum puree, which you can do all sorts of things. Think about blintzes with wild plum sauce in them. Yeah. Wild plums and choke cherries, for instance, in the Great Plains. Most of our little shrubs, we don't put those in prairie restorations. Hell, many of us are afraid of them, right? They're going to invade the prairie, why right? keep them out? They're not part of the prairie, right? When we put together a list of prairie plants for our restorations, do we include shrubs? Shrubs are part of the prairie. When I wrote both of my books, I took a bioregional perspective. What are the native plants in our area besides trees and forests? Plums are part of the prairie. Chuck cherries are part of the prairie. We need to include those. Ah, be creative with it. Put them on the edge next to the woody stuff that's already there. Put them along the fence line. That's where they seem to come up. And then burn the hell out of them occasionally, right? <laughs> Knock them back. Disturbance is good. You know, put them on three or four sides of the prairie and just decide which side you're going to really burn and burn up, right? But plums are wonderful. Okay, brief interlude. I would like to hear from the crowd favorite prairie plants. I'm going to show mine next. I want five people, hands up. What's your favorite prairie plant? Just quickly. Call them out if you want. What's your favorite prairie plant? Yes. All right, what else? Great, what else? I heard one of those. What was this one? 
Good. What else? One more. All right. Here's mine. I love to eat this plant. This is my favorite food plant. Lamb's quarters. How many of you plant lamb's quarters in your prairie restorations? You know, Chris was talking about that. We're not afraid of annual weeds in our prairies. They're not quite competitive unless you go out and disturb them. You know those patches where you're not going to dig the roots? Make sure you scatter a bunch of kinopodium seed there. These are tasty. With butter and salt, most greens, they're fantastic. Long, long history in this part of the world of farmers, Native American farmers with cornfields, bean fields, mixed crops, would tolerate kinopodiums, encourage them in fields. I do that in my garden. I love having all these lamb's quarters come up. We need to collect lamb's quarter seed, amaranth seed, annual seeds, sunflower seeds, annuals. Get them in our restoration sites. They're tasty. We've published on this, at least on the nutritional value of these plants. This was a paper just published last year. Some of the highest sources of protein and fiber are in our wild plants. Kenopodium being at the top, amaranths, which are known. This was funded by Kellogg's of Battle Creek, who has interest in our prairie plants. Not enough interest to put them in their Kashi brand, but we really got some funding to look at that <laughs> because they want, they want wild foods and they want the stories behind them. They recognize that for marketing. You know, we have to be in the marketing business. We need to sell our prairies. We need to sell prairie protection. We need to sell the value of prairie. They get this. Why don't we? We need to show the importance of these plants to other people. We need to excite kids about these plants. We need to get chefs interested in these plants. Wild parsley. Great parsley substitute. This could be the garnish on thousands and thousands of plates of food daily. Jerusalem artichokes, another problem plant, right? We all know they can be a pain in the ass in the garden, coming up everywhere. They're great food. There's great stories about this food. Native folks showed Lewis and Clark going up the river about uh, Jerusalem artichokes. On further review, in talking to Omaha, Melvin Gilmore, the ethnobotanist, found out that the name translates for essentially food for homeless boys. Because if you eat too many Jerusalem artichokes, the indigestible uh, carbohydrates cause gas. So you're going to send those boys to be out by themselves. Some people will even refer to these as fartichokes, right? <laughs> Kids love these stories, right? We should be telling them. The tubers are tasty and good. Just moderation, OK, you know? Thistlus. I now call them wild tomatillos. I've helped, I'm helping to change the name. Please adopt this. Do not call them ground cherries. They're not cherries. They don't even look like cherries. They're too green to be cherries. And they're not even on the ground. They're upright. <laughs> People now know tomatillos. So these are all wild tomatillos. Husk tomatoes have exceptionally tasty fruits when they're ripe. I took great pride in, in, in the fact that for my edible plant book, I tried all 123 species in that plant book. Tried every single one of them. I wrote my medicinal plants to prairie book, over 200 and some species. I didn't try them all for medicine. First, you have to be a hypochondriac, right? <laughs> and, you know, I don't have menstrual problems, you know, so, <laughs> you know, so, you know, it was much harder. But this was one that, we don't know about food. The wild tomatillos I ate originally were not ripe. I got them in the fall, but they were still green. Most of the species will turn yellow or yellow-green or bright yellow, depending on which species. They are wonderful food. They're in the majority of archaeological sites in the Midwest and Great Plains, the seeds, which means they're used as food. They were great food to be put into stews and sauces. They were just eaten as they were. When dried, they are as good as sweetened cranberries and actually taste a little bit similar. This plant right here, Thistles longifolia, is highly anti-cancer. This plant ranked highest in antioxidants of all 200 species that we tested for antioxidants of prairie plants across the Great Plains. 
There's a relationship between antioxidants and cancer. KU Medical Center uh, took great interest in this and found out that this plant scored high in its anti-cancer activity. The lab, chemistry lab we worked with, extracted this, has patented this compound. I'm not excited about patents, but just to show you how excited they were about this, the compound caused a reduction in cells of breast cancer, looked promising on tumors related to lymph nodes, and the compounds in the fruit, in the food. Not, and to show that, we have rats that uh, have induced tumors. They force-fed the rats these fruits of this species of wild tomatillos, and the tumors reduced in size. Food as anti-cancer. Unfortunately, it's not gone further. It appears that the effects were not long-lived. Um, but traditional people, and us prairie people, should be eating anti-cancer wild foods. Food is medicine. Results of this, of course, is I finally got my hands on the cover of Economic Botany, holding these wild tomatillos. They are tasty. If you want to read more about this, this is uh, in this issue, talking about the ethnobotany of its use and the medicinal benefits. Echinacea angustifolia. My favorite species as a medicine. Um, been used extensively. Echinacea's popularity is much greater in other parts of the world. Echinacea is only native to the United States and a tiny bit of Canadian plains. In Germany, it's behind the counter at pharmacies. In the US, we don't have herbal products behind the counter. You buy them up front, along with the Pampers and Coca-Cola. Shows you where they rank in our culture. A fabulous plant to reduce your colds to keep you from getting the flu. Great clinical trials. There's great data on this. If you fly long distance, like to Australia and back, you'll reduce the length, in clinical trial, you'll reduce the length of your cold or flu and re pretend, potentially just avoid getting it. So there's proof on some of these things. Natives use it as cure-all, everything from snake bite to dealing with being sick. And now we know it has more than one immune stimulating compound in it. We need this echinacea pallida. All the echinaceas have good medicine. We should be harvesting them. We should be harvesting from our restorations. We can even harvest them from other places. The compounds are throughout the plant, traditionally the roots used. We got concerned about over harvest of wild roots for echinacea, but our detailed studies show that half, 50%, of plants harvested for the trade, and we had sites in both Kansas and Montana re-sprout, even though you're taking four to six inches of the root. But the medicine's in the tops, so we can harvest the tops, make tincture, just a nice alcohol extract. It tastes nasty like many medicines do, but it's effective. We need to be talking about this, teaching about this. Insects still eat them. They're tasty, the insects too, even though they uh, are anti-insect. So just as an overview, about to wrap up. As an example, we looked at some prairie sites in the center of Kansas, rich prairies, and you have all these species that have uses. Like I said, we, we've documented several hundred prairie plant species that have uses in ethnobotany, as food, as medicine, and craft. So the prairie is full of this, and yet we don't use these in our restoration sites. So we need to encourage people to benefit from this biodiversity. And not that people have to always be the entities at the top of the chain, but we've got to engage people in this effort. It'll help them be maintained. If people want to go collect and want to go manage so they can get more, we can involve more people. These should be part of our communities. We need to include more edge species Woody species, plums, choke cherries, and our restoration planning efforts. We need the weedy species, the amaranths, the quinopos, all the annuals. We need to envision landscapes that are for us again so we can go forage and go take people with us. So it's not just a walk identifying plants, which I enjoy greatly, but it's a walk about uses and how you can use these, how I use these. And I believe for restoration success. And I believe for prairie preservation, we need to have these stories and we need to encourage use. Of course, use has to be sustainable. Use has to be carefully planned, but we should encourage it. 
We need to envision plants and wild landscapes that we all enjoy and love and engage in. Thank you.